Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at stationary waves, also known as standing waves. So let's get into it. So it starts here by saying that stationary waves, also known as standing waves, are formed by the constructive interference of two waves of the same frequency and amplitude traveling in opposite directions. When a wave is reflected and the reflected wave becomes inverted, the two waves can create interference in the form of a stationary wave. So if you look at this picture here, the solid black line represents the instant wave going towards this fixed boundary. And then you've got this dashed line which reflects off the wall and is inverted. So this is your reflected wave here. And what this does is it creates regions called nodes and antinodes. So it says this creates nodes with zero disturbance, i.e. zero amplitude, which are separated by a half wavelength. So the nodes are these points here where the two waves cross over, and that is the points of zero disturbance or zero amplitude. But we also say the points in between these are called antinodes, and these are points of maximum disturbance or maximum amplitude, and these are also separated by half a wavelength. So the antinodes are these points here between the nodes, and this is where we get maximum disturbance or maximum amplitude. It then says to note that a stationary wave travels neither to the right nor the left, the wave crests remain at fixed positions while the particles of the waves move up and down in unison. And I'm just going to show you a few simulations to help you visualise this. So let's send our wave going from left to right first of all, which would look something like this. So you can see the positions of the crests and troughs are moving from left to right. However, let's say we had a fixed boundary at this end and the wave was then able to reflect off this end and come back the way, then we would get interference produced and our stationary wave formed. So let's send our second wave to the left. So now we've got a second wave going from right to left and you'll see we get this kind of pattern shown. So we've got these stationary waves or standing waves produced. So if we look at the positions of the crests and troughs here, we can see they appear to stay put. They appear to stay in the same position. They're not moving from left to right along the wave like we saw initially. And this is why it's called a stationary wave because the particles appear to be stationary in terms of their horizontal movement. Obviously we do see this kind of vertical motion, but horizontally the particles don't appear to be moving. So the crests and troughs appear to be in the same place. And remember we said this forms points of zero amplitude and points of maximum amplitude. And we can label these. So let's start with the nodes, which are the points of zero amplitude or zero disturbance. So that would be around there. And we could label another one. That's going to be, say, the one over here. And we've then got antinodes, which, remember, are the points of maximum amplitude. So the antinodes would be where the particles are the highest or the lowest in terms of the crests or troughs. So that would be that point there. And then we could label another one, say, in the middle as well. So something like that. And if we pause it here, hopefully you can see that the nodes are separated by half a wavelength and the two antinodes are also separated by half a wavelength, lambda over two. So I've given the distance between two nodes or two antinodes, you would be able to work out the wavelength of the waves. And we could do that using the ruler here. So if I position my ruler between the two nodes here, you can see I'm getting just over nine centimeters for my distance between the two nodes. So that means I could say lambda over two is equal to nine centimeters. So that means my wavelength here of this wave would be 18 centimeters. I could do the same between the antinodes distance. So let's put the ruler between those two and you can see it's just about nine centimeters or just above there. So again, we'd get a wavelength of 18 centimeters. Now we've got another simulation here to show you what happens with standing or stationary waves. And this is called waves on a string. So imagine you've got this string here and it's fixed at one end. So if you create a pulse at one end, a wave on your string, then you'll see it travel along until it gets to the fixed end at which point it's going to reflect and become inverted. Now, if we were to send another wave along this string, you'll see that interference occurs at the point where the two waves meet. And when the interference occurs, you're going to get points of constructive interference and points of destructive interference. And we're saying that stationary waves are produced by the constructive interference between the two waves here. Now, instead of using the pulse feature, we can use the oscillate feature. And all I've done is increase the amplitude and frequency of the waves. And I've given them a wee bit of damping and changed the tension from low to high. And I'll show you what the waves look like in slow motion. So if we click play here, we get an oscillation. So our wave traveling along until it's going to reflect off this fixed end. And then we get our interference pattern produced and eventually the standing or stationary waves formed. So you'll see here, the green particles are moving up and down and that just shows you what the particles are doing. So instead of the wave looking like it's going from left to right, we've got the particles appearing to move up and down. So if I put my cursor at the position of one of the highest points of the waves, the crests, then you'll see the crest appears to be at the same position. The wave isn't moving along from left to right. 
and that means the trough is going to be directly below the crest as well as the particles move down. So this is our stationary waves or standing waves that are produced. Now we could do the same thing that we did in the previous simulation to show you how to find the wavelength of these waves. So if we pause the wave here like so and then use our rulers, we can measure the distance between say two antinodes. So let's say we start at zero centimeters on this crest and then we go along to the next antinode which is at this trough. I'm getting a distance of just over 1.2 centimeters. So let's just say we rounded it to 1.2 centimeters to make it easy for ourselves. Then that means we could say that half a wavelength lambda over two is equal to 1.2 centimeters. So to find what one wavelength is, we just multiply it by two. So we get lambda is equal to not 1.2, but 2.4 centimeters. So the wavelength of these waves is roughly 2.4 centimeters. Going back to the notes, it says that stationary waves can be set up by any wave source where the wave is reflected from a surface, such as sound waves or microwaves. For example, microwaves with a wavelength of 3 cm instant on a metal reflector plate will produce stationary waves. The nodes will be separated by a distance of 1.5 cm. So here's a picture showing you what would happen in the situation of microwaves. So you've got microwaves being emitted from this emitter here, travelling towards the metal reflector plate, and then reflecting from the plate so we get our two waves, one travelling from left to right, one travelling from right to left, and then we'll get our nodes and antinodes formed due to interference. And then what you can do is use a detector connected to a meter to detect regions of weak microwave signals and strong microwave signals. And these weak signals would correspond to the points of zero displacement or zero amplitude, which would be your nodes, and the strong signals would represent antinodes, where you've got points of maximum amplitude or maximum disturbance. It then says to note that the fact that adjacent nodes are separated by a half wavelength can be used to calculate the wavelength of a wave. And we just did that in our two simulations earlier. Now I'll just show you a quick simulation producing stationary waves using microwaves. So in an experiment you could set up a microwave transmitter some distance away from a metal reflector and you could use a meter stick to measure distances with a detector probe and a microammeter there as well. And the detector probe would be connected to the microammeter to help you detect regions of strong and weak microwaves. So it says microwaves are reflected back along their path using the metal reflector. The detector probe is connected to the microammeter which gives a measure of the wave's amplitude. It then says click play to move the probe to the right. Count the antinodes, i.e. the maxima, as the probe moves. The positions of the first and last antinode are marked. So we'll know we're at an antinode or a maxima when the microammeter shoots up when the dial goes up to a high value here. So if we click play, we've got one antinode, two antinodes, three antinodes, four antinodes, five antinodes, six antinodes, and seven antinodes. And then it stopped. So we've got seven antinodes there and we've got the distance marked out. So it says measure the distance from the first to the last antinode. So each increment here is a centimeter. So we're starting at 16 centimeters and we're going up to 25 centimeters. So we could say the distance between the first and last antinode is 25 minus 16, which is nine centimeters. And that means we could say there were seven antinodes and the distance across the seven antinodes is nine centimeters. And we can use the distance between just two adjacent antinodes, not across seven of them, to find the wavelength of the microwaves here. So if you think about it and look at the pattern of the waves here, we just want the distance from the first antinode to the next antinode. We don't want the distance across seven of them. But if we count the gaps between the antinodes, that will allow us to find the distance between just two of the antinodes. So you'll see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So we've got six gaps of antinodes going from the first point to the last point. And that's why it says there are six gaps between seven antinodes here. So that means we could take our distance of nine centimeters and divide it by six because we've got six gaps there. And that will give us the distance between the two adjacent antinodes. So if we do that, we get a value of 1.5 centimeters here. Now a common mistake would be to divide the nine by seven thinking that there are seven gaps, but we're not just going to divide nine by the total number of antinodes because that wouldn't give us the distance between two adjacent nodes. So just remember to divide by the number of gaps, not the total number of antinodes. So if we know that the distance between two antinodes is 1.5 centimeters, remember that's equal to half a wavelength lambda over two. So all we need to do is multiply that by two to get our final answer. So we could say the distance between consecutive antinodes is lambda over two. So we just do 1.5 times two, which gives us our three centimeters for microwaves. And that's the value for the wavelength of microwaves that we had in the notes. Jumping back to the notes now, it says that musical instruments make use of stationary waves to produce the different notes. For example, when a guitar string vibrates, it is actually standing waves that are created. When the guitar player puts their finger on a certain fret, they change the length of the string, which in turn changes the note played. 
and you can see the picture of the guitar here showing the waves on the string. So that's your standing waves created because of this fixed end. It then says similarly for woodwind instruments such as the flute, recorder or bagpipes, the length of the air column is changed by covering or uncovering certain holes, which in turn changes the note. It then goes on to say, consider the most basic form of a standing wave shown below. At the fixed ends of the medium, for example the guitar string, no oscillations occur. These points are nodes. So for the guitar string, it's going to be fixed at both ends. So we have points of zero amplitude or zero disturbance there, which will be our nodes. And then you'll see we've just got the one anti-node, which is between the two nodes. And this is our most basic form of standing wave shown here. It then says, because of the condition of having a node at each end, we can build up a picture of the allowed modes of oscillation as shown below. So here we start off with our most basic mode of oscillation called the first harmonic, and this is also called the fundamental mode. And we could also label the distance between the two nodes, i.e. the length of the string, as length L, capital L. And you'll see for the first one here we have our inverted wave which is shown by the dashed line. So these two waves here show a standing wave pattern, but it's the most basic form. And that's our half a wavelength. We then have the second harmonic, also known as the first overtone, which is where we have a full wavelength pattern shown between the two fixed points. And again, we've got the wave inverted here. So you could think about it as like two half wavelengths creating a full wavelength, therefore it's called the second harmonic, or just a full wavelength. We've then got the third harmonic, which is three half wavelengths, and this is also known as the second overtone, or it's the same as saying one and a half wavelengths. And again, this wave pattern is inverted to create these stationary waves. And lastly, we have the fourth harmonic, which shows four half wavelengths, or two full waves, and this is also known as the third overtone. And again we get this stationary wave or standing wave pattern produced. It then says since any two adjacent nodes are separated by half a wavelength, it follows that there must only be certain allowed wavelengths and therefore frequencies of the wave. These different frequencies are called the harmonics of the system. The first four harmonics of a standing wave are shown in the picture above. So these are the ones that we've just seen. And then it says things that we've already talked about. The first harmonic is also called the fundamental mode. The second harmonic is also called the first overtone. And lastly, the third harmonic is also called the second overtone and so on. And if you play musical instruments, you've maybe heard of the word harmonics before. That's all for this video, folks. Thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.